Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that as we gather together this morning in the name of your Son, that you are we ask that you would open up our hearts and minds to your presence. That you would use liturgy, words, sacrament, song, and prayer to speak to us, informing in us that which you desire. And so we say, even as Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Great to be here this morning. My wife and I both are very, very excited. I'm thinking about this weekend, uh, as I told the choir, as we gathered before uh, John, Tish, Laura, and I had dinner last night. I'm out. We had a great time together. You have a jam. I want you to know that. You have a jam. <laughs> and I'm thrilled that they can be here. In fact, when he came for the interview uh, to meet with me, we finished the interview, and I met Tish, and then I turned to Marilyn Lang, who is Ken and Tim Nunes' secretary, and I said, gosh, I wish I had 10 of them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very, very excited to meet and look forward to some real ministry in the gospel that happens through this place in a way that really does affect the villages for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In thinking about this particular occasion, which is the induction of a new rector. Obviously, what I think you want, I certainly do, and I think you do, is that John have a long and successful ministry here. That he's not a short timer, but that instead he makes the time to get to know you, to build relationships, to enjoy your company, to be able to get your jokes and know the things that are going on in the life of the community. I mean, that's a part of what it means to build these relationships that are so tender and precious to us as fellow members of the body of Christ. As Jesus makes so clear in the gospel, the command that you see is to love each other. And that means in very, very practical ways, we make the time. We get together, we learn what sports you like, what do you watch on television, what do you see in movies, where do you like to go? And you share in those kinds of events together, as well as the kinds of ministries that happen in the life of St. George Church. In other words, what's not happening in these relationships is that they're like work relationships, where you have your church life over here, and that circle of friends, and then you have the rest of your life over here, and never the twain shall meet. Typically, if there's that kind of bifurcation, in relationships, it's because you want it that way because you want to be a certain kind of person when you're with your Christian friends. But then you want to be another kind of person when you're with your social friends. And you want to make sure that this group doesn't see how you are over there. And more importantly, vice versa. I think what Jesus calls us to is a, is a wholeness it really does begin to see all of life from the perspective of what does it mean to be a servant of Jesus as we do call ourselves we see Christians. And that God would equip John, in part, to help lead this congregation in that kind of direction. In fact, in thinking about it, Thursday, I was driving from the office, diocesan office back home, and I had all things considered on the NPR show, which I like. And they were featuring a particular book uh, by a man named Roger Angel, who for the longest time wrote on baseball uh, for the New Yorker magazine. And particularly given the fact that we're moving toward the World Series at a fairly quick pace. I thought it was wonderful because he described a long and successful baseball season. And I think there's a great analogy between that and a long and successful tenure between a rector and his congregation. And he writes in the book that was featured these words. He says this. He says this. The long season traces an arc like a lifetime condensed. Midsummer baseball feels as if it would last forever. The late season baseball becomes quicker and terser as if sensing that it's coming to an end. 
But it goes on, and if we are lucky, meaning in the playoffs, it explodes into thrilling terminal colors, leaving bright pictures in memory to carry us through the months to come. And that's actually my hope, is that in the midst of this kind of anticipating excitement that marks this occasion, that it would move from that into a place of that midsummer baseball season where if it's going well, you just think it's the best in the world. And then as John begins to move toward a place of retirement, instead of coasting, which is unfortunately what happens with some coaches, as they get retirement in view, all of their creative energies just begin to shut down. And they do the minimum until they can get out the door and get their pension. Uh, those are the clergy that keep me up at night. <laughs> but resisting that temptation, and I mean that quite literally, um, instead what happens is that there is actually some new movement. A desire to, as Bob Buford writes, finish well where you really do begin to think of these last years and in the retirement is a new vista that God has opened for you. To in fact, out of that, discover a fresh sense of purpose and perhaps a new direction as you're moving into those years, knowing that you, even in those years, are in fact a servant of God. And that's what he says. If we are lucky, what happens at the end? is that it explodes into thrilling terminal colors, leaving bright, bright pictures in memory to carry us through the months to come. John, that's what I desire for you. And uh, so that when finally he does move into retirement and takes on something else in life, this congregation will be left with the bright colors of memory, of the wonder, wondrous times that God gave you and he together in this chapter in the life of St. George's Church. But for that to happen requires, it seems to me, a certain kind of equipment. And I believe that equipment is what gets described in the scriptures this morning. And so what I want to do actually is start with the Gospel of John and very quickly move backward. But think first about the Gospel. Because Jesus is describing in the Gospel reading the kind of relationship between the Christian and that Christian's God that one needs to be able to think about the Christian life in the long view. You see, it, it's possible to have a certain kind of experience of God. And it is for you one of those kind of bright color moments, but it doesn't actually have any kind of profound effect on one's day-to-day -day life. So it's a memory, but it's not fuel for the journey. I think if we're going to live as Christians within this kind of holistic environment where we're making the decision to serve Jesus wherever we go, that requires fuel for the journey. There are way too many temptations in life that would want to split us into pieces. And what that does besides put us in the position of somehow trying to be an actor, to be the kind of person that this group of people want us to be, it actually creates damage in the soul. And in fact, if you carry it to its logical conclusion, in the end, you're not really sure who you are. Am I this person? Am I this person? And so there's a kind of grounding that needs to happen that both brings peace to our soul, but also provides the kind of fuel necessary to live out this kind of holistic Christian life. And I say that because that will be both a temptation to any person in the ordained ministry, as well as to any person in the pew. It's a part of what we have in common. It is that need to please. And more often than not, accompanied by a need to be needed in a way that really can suck the life out of you. If there are these twinges of fear that happen, inside of you, more often than not, a part of what that says is, oh, I, want it, I want it to go well, because if I don't, maybe they will think less of me. And that kind of inner drivenness that is anything other 
than the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ and the love that we receive from him produces a kind of inner security that allows us to be fully ourselves in Christ wherever we are. And how does that happen? Well, it starts looking your lessons to the leaflet of the John lesson. How does that come about? It literally starts with the opening line. Jesus speaking, you see, to his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. In other words, number one, there is no distinction between the love God pours out upon his only Son, the second person of the Trinity, and the love that he pours out on you. And notice that the verb is past tense. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. In other words, that love is coming at us and being poured upon us regardless of the state of our lives. In other words, there's no sense that somehow, okay, I definitely want God to love me. So what I have to do because I really want God to love me is to be obedient to the things that he tells me to do. And what that creates in us is that kind of performance mentality that says, well, if I'm doing pretty well, then God must love me right now. In fact, you'll, you know, I love this. My neighbor across the street was uh, helping me install a mailbox in my front yard. I, I was not doing very, very well, I must confess. And he saw my plight, carried his box of tools, and made his way over to the other side of the street. And He's a nominally faithful Roman Catholic, and a prince of a guy, he's a doctor. And, uh, and so he would get us, as you know, these kits that you put together are not always lined up exactly right when you're trying to get a screw through each of those things. So it, it takes finesse. It's not a question of merely following directions, if you can decipher the directions that are given. And so he would get one particular screw threaded all the way through each one of those holes, and he'd look up and he'd smile and say, see, I asked Jesus to help me with that one. <laughs> and then if one wasn't, wasn't working so well, he'd look at me and say, I guess you need to pray. Jesus is not helping me. <laughs> As if somehow the help of Jesus was contingent in some way on the character and the quality of my skill and faith. If that's true, we're sunk. <laughs> Which is why the past tense of the verb have love is so important because a part of what Jesus is communicating so clearly to his disciples is that I love you even when you didn't know me, even know who I was. I love you when you messed up, and of course, the gospel is extraordinarily transparent about how many times the disciples of Jesus just didn't get it and did the wrong thing. It's meant, in fact, to be a witness to us. The while there are times, of course, when I get this sense that Jesus just sort of sitting on his heavenly throne rolls his eyes. Oh no. The fact of the matter is, is that that does not limit his capacity or even his desire, more importantly, to pour the kind of love that our human heart so desperately needs. His love for us is not in any way predicated on our behavior. I mean, full stop, think about it. That's incredibly important. Because you see, if, if John feels that way, in his position as your rector. He'll always be in performance mode. You know, put the game face on, know how to work the room, smile sweetly, make sure I remember the name, say the right thing that's supposed to be so important. So when I leave the room, everybody will go, what a great rector. <laughs> as opposed to looking you in the eye, actually speaking out of his heart, and saying, how are you? It's great to see you. And you can tell by the character of his face that that's a real question. It's an invitation for conversation and that he actually cares. You see, that perfectionistic mentality actually gets in the way of us being genuinely human in God with one another because I'm always trying to put my best foot forward. That means
means actually what happens is I care more about what you think of me and my performance than actually caring for you as a person. You've met people like that, haven't you? Nod your head. <laughs> All eyes are on them and that's how they want it. And there are people, you've met them I'm sure, who are masters at how to work the room and make the right joke. It's a very well honed but again, that's not what you want a director. You want a director who actually loves you. Which is why at the heartbeat of this passage is, what's the commandment? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Because that is, in fact, in the end, the mark of any kind of Christian ministry. Not only in terms of your rector, but also for people who head up kind of programs and do the kinds of things that make a church one. The end result in the eyes of God is not so much that the program was successful, but that instead that people felt loved and cared for, and that you were kind of in this together. In other words, the task is always relational. Or to put it another way, for all of the driven perfectionists in our midst, myself included, People are always more important than programs. It's something we have to learn because particularly our business careers did not teach that to us. If the focus is in fact the bottom line in getting things done and literally measuring the caliber of your relationships with your coworkers as to who can help you best get what you're supposed to get done accomplished, right? Nod your head. That's how it is. <laughs> That's a part of the temptation in the church as well. And so that within the confines of this fellowship of people, whether we're talking about the altar guild, or an outreach program, or a meal being served, or whatever the ministry might be, the goal, if the command is to love one another as I have loved you, is that sure, you serve a great meal, the altar looks terrific, and there's outreach programs that are in fact making a difference. But also, at the same time, there's that sense of, I'm being loved, and I'm loving others. That's a challenge, particularly for people who are driven to accomplish. That is, in fact, we see the call of the gospel. Just as you want a rector who loves you, no matter what, so you want fellow Christians who will love you, no matter what. But notice that the command of the scriptures is not wait for people who will love you like that. Instead, the command of the scriptures is you love one another as I have loved. To do that means receiving in very fresh ways the love that God has for us. Because if I don't know in the depths of my soul that I am in fact loved profoundly by the one before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, it will be very, very difficult for me to love you like that. In other words, the loving one another, the commandment, is in fact the fruit of our relationship with God and asking Him to show us, Lord, help me learn what it means to know that you love me and to help me to learn how to apply, because that's, that's what the commandment is, to love you. I, don't, I confess to you, I don't know how to do that. I'm driven. I get pulled in lots of different directions. I'm very tense. I can be lazy as you know what at times, and it drives me nuts. And therefore, I'm always feeling like there's some kind of tight place inside me because it's just how I am. I need you to come and literally unwind the tight places. I need you to come and to break down the places where I still feel <laughs> tense and fearful. I need you to come and bring forgiveness into the dark places of my life that I wish weren't there. I need you to come and love me in the very way that the scripture describes.
describes. And the wondrous thing is that Jesus will do just that. <laughs> Those are not empty prayers. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So that it begins to happen instead of that kind of tension. There's a joy in it. You know you're alive and you're gathering a team together to go and it's, it's fun. You're doing something together. Is it hard work? Yeah, it's hard work. And at the same time, you're learning how to laugh You're learning how to create inside jokes. You're learning how to be a team. But someone who with Tish's wife, are giving at that very same level for you. In other words, it's about setting pace and asking God to give you what you need to live this kind of, quite honestly, supernatural life. You can have a church that has a lot of good programs and they do great work, but there's a kind of coldness about it. And when that is the fact of the case, that's a church where tasks are more important than people. I've been in churches like that. Maybe you have to. What I'm saying to you is, is that the task is to love. That people are in fact more important than tasks. Because that's Jesus' commandment. And that's in fact how he loves us. He loves us whether we're doing well in our tasks or whether we're making fools of ourselves. He still loves us. Does he want us to do well? Well, of course he does. So he knows how to heal our hearts and give us that capacity to release what it is that he's put inside us. So my hope is, is that this would mark a beginning, a very important beginning, a beginning to be led and to live together in a way that really does look just like this gospel. Will we always succeed? But is there forgiveness? Yes. So that we can learn to laugh at our mistakes, make the apologies necessary when we offend, and still stick together, because that's what Jesus is asking of us. Amen. <laughs>